It's been about maybe three different times that we've been in church that I thought that I may end up preaching this message, and it didn't work out. Last week, I shared a, just a teeny tiny little nugget from this message. I talked to you about distractions, but that was just one little bitty tiny thing or piece. So... I'm of the mind to believe this morning that God knew before you got here that he reserved this message for this service. So if you're here this morning, I don't believe it's by coincidence, and I do not believe it's coincidental that we'll be preaching this with the help of the Lord today. Let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you recently have faced any kind of pressure in your life? on the job, in your marriage, with your family, mentally, anybody faced any pressure, battles on your mind, making you feel worthless, a lot of pressure. Well, it's 2023, and guess what? Not much has changed. With the Lord's help, I'd, I'd like to preach something that... Uh, I may have preached something similar in the past, but I've never preached this. I'd like to preach this morning with the Lord's help on it. It still takes a fighter. It still takes a fighter. I want you to open your Bibles, if you will, this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to get ready and read there in just a moment. If you're watching online, joining us. Share the video with your friends and family. Thank you for being a faithful follower and a part of Gray Street Ministry. But this text that we're about to read, some of you may be familiar with it, but it's a glimpse into the life and a moment where the Apostle Paul describes his own difficulties in presenting and preaching the gospel. This is a personal letter, a personal writing, if you will. To me, when I hear somebody preach, the messages that come from the heart just seem to speak to me the greatest. I think it was Leonard Ravenhill years ago that made the statement, a message that comes from the heart will reach the heart. A message that comes to, from the mind will reach the mind. To me, when I read the words of Paul, this is coming from his heart. He's talking about all the difficulties that he's faced, Sister Nora, in presenting the gospel. These hardships were a product of opposition that he faced in several different areas. He faced opposition from religious leaders. As long as you've been a Christian, have you ever faced any opposition from other people that claim to be a Christian? He faced opposition in beatings and punishment for preaching the gospel. Can you imagine being beat for preaching the gospel? That's what happened to him. The isolation and confinement, he, he speaks of his difficulties of being confined and locked up in prison for the gospel. He speaks of natural disasters like shipwreck, these challenges that he's faced. He was robbed along the journey. He was hated by the unconverted. He was lied on by false accusers. He's weary from difficulties of the mission God's called him to. and He's even gone times without food and water, and if that's not enough, on top of all of that, his immense responsibility to oversee the churches that God had led him to plant and oversee. I guess it's fair to say that Paul faced some incredible challenges. But somebody believe me this morning that Paul was a fighter. The Bible that you hold in your hands, or if you have a cell phone and you have the Scripture available, readily available, some of that you can be thankful for the man who fought and who recorded the events by the name of Paul. Let's read 2 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 23. 
As you read this, I want you to think of how personal these statements are. This is a man just being brutally honest. Paul says in verse number 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant in stripes, above measure in prisons, more frequent in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, Perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, and watchings often, and hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. In other words, these scars of difficulty in my life are proof that I love the Lord more than I love this life. Anyone else feel the same way? Let's have a word of prayer over the Word of God this morning and ask the Lord to just have His will and way. Father, as we embark on the mission you have set before us, God, to reach into the Word of God, extract out what you have prepared for this service, I pray, God, that you'll add the anointing upon the words that I speak, and I pray let them become power and life to the hearer, and I pray, God, it will be meat to the soul that is hungry water to the thirsty. And I pray, God, today before this service is over with, that many lives and souls will be touched and affected by this one message. And I pray, God, that it will be the catalyst to help someone to hold on and keep fighting in a season of difficulty. And everyone can say amen. I put a lot of thought over the last couple of weeks into this message that the Lord has put on my heart and has I look at the overall condition of the church. Has anyone ever stopped and just thought about the place that the church is in? Have you ever done that before and just considered the direction that the overall church is going in? The more that I've done that, what I see from my my vantage point, if you will, I see a church that is fastly becoming a generation that believes Christianity is less about being a fighting soldier and more about being a celebrating saint. That's what it seems to me. Uh, The truth is that uh, the greatest emphasis that we see in a lot of your churches today is more on a euphoric experience, the excitement and the buzz in the air and the the energy of uh, big worship service, and all of those things may have their place in our Christian experience. But That is not how you're going to survive the race that is in front of you. As a matter of fact, it's as if when I look at it, I look about uh, outside the church, and what I can see outside of the church is affecting the church on the inside. To me, it's as if this fast-paced, short clip like TikTok kind of a generation and these short little dopamine fixes that people are so bent on in the online world and social media and such has begun to creep its way into the expectations that people have to, to the way that church is supposed to be, to the way that church is supposed to feel. 
Uh, I've had other people share the same sentiment, but I think it was Sister Rachel that made a comment to me not long ago, said, I don't need a lot of this other stuff that people think they need to be able to to, to have church, and I just want to be in a place where I know the love of God is and a, and a place where I know the truth of the Word of God is, where the Spirit of the Lord is. I don't need a bunch of excitement and theatrics and everything else to prop me up because that's not what my experience is built upon. But I can assure you that when we look back to the Word of God, the early Christians who were martyred for their faith and the ones that were hiding out in catacombs and and uh, trying just to find a safe way to have worship service and, and the ones who embraced the many dangers of being skinned alive or burned at the stake for evangelizing the mission fields, I can ensure you they were not entranced uh, by some experience. They did what they did because they knew what was at stake. They knew that their faith and their what was anchored in Christ and Christ alone was not built up on some sort of emotional high or feeling. You see, the problem with having a dependency on excitement and feel-good experiences that to get you through is when the flame of your experience has begun to come to go dim, then the fire of a person's desire often goes out with it. Anyone understand what I mean by that? In other words, when the church is not flying high and I go to church and I don't have that big, great excitement like I just took a, a toke of meth or, you know, because that's the way some people view their experiences like it's supposed to be always in some sort of euphoric feeling. But I've got news for you. Survivors understand that church is not always going to be like that. My daily life. It's not going to be like that. And if you make it out like that, when you're in church, you're selling somebody out on a false pretense because when you get outside of church, I can assure you that it ain't going to be like that out there. Come on, somebody, and say amen. But if you survive the road that is ahead of you, you are going to have to be a fighter. If you're going to make it through 2023, come out on the other side and not be on the church prayer list, pray for them. They're backslid. Pray for them. They're not in the fight anymore. If you're going to make it on the other side of this race in 2023, you're going to have to be a fighter. You're going to have to understand there are going to be serious trials in your life. Anybody make it through some stuff in 2022 that you were surprised you even made it through? Things that you didn't know how it was going to go, but there you are sitting on the pew today. You see, there's a lot of things that you're going to face. And the saints of God, as I look back through the years and the biblical uh, patriarchs of the Bible, they understood that you're going to need more than a two-hour worship service to make it in this fight. You're going to need more than somebody to prop you up with gimmicks and tricks and that sort of thing. But God did not call, not me or any other pastor, to train up or raise up cheerleaders in the church. I'll tell you what God called us to do. And if more pastors would get a hold of this, they'd be a lot better off. God didn't call me to be a cheerleader. He called me to, to train up uh, those that are going to be a soldier and a fighter in the army of the Lord. How many of you understand uh, that if more pastors would preach the reality of how that hell is violent, how the enemy fights us on every hand, that they would understand uh, that the reason that some people have fallen by the wayside they weren't fighters. The reason why that some have let go of the plow and look back is because somebody did not help them to understand you are going to have to be a fighter. When I was at my lowest point, the only thing that kept me in the race a lot of times was the grace of God and a little bit of fight left inside of me. I'm one of those I will tell you that this is just what I believe uh, that if you ever get to the place as a child of God that you lose your fight, you are in trouble. Now you might get sad, you might get depressed, you might get angry, you might get frustrated, you might go through times of temptation and even disappoint yourself. 
But sister and brother, when you lose that fight you got inside of you, that fight that says you're scarred, you're bleeding, you're hurting, but get back up. If you ever lose that fight, you're in bad shape. And the moment that you feel your fight going out of your spirit, man, you better get up and pay attention. You better find yourself an altar and get back. When you feel yourself fading and your fight going out, you better find you a church revival and get, get back in the altars and begin to pray again. When you begin to lose your fight, you better find you another Christian brother or Christian sister and yoke up with them and get some encouragement from the saints of God. When you feel that fight going out of you, you better pay attention and become alert because before you know it, the enemy sees that you're like a boxer who's got the daylights beat out of them and he sees how weak you are. He knows how to come out of the other corner swinging with everything he's got when you're already weak and you're already down. Honey, if you're in a place that you felt a lot of pressure, it's not by coincidence the enemy knew just how to come against you. And when you think that it's the least expected thing, you will come around to a place of your walk where the devil's fighting you in places you never thought he would fight fights you in. Well, we got a great marriage. Well, I can assure you the enemy knows that. And if he can fight you in that area of your life, things will be great at church, great at work. And home feels like you're standing on the doorstep of hell. Say amen. The enemy understands that. But it takes a Christian who realizes that it's all right to worship. We're supposed to worship. We're supposed to feel the goodness of God. But whether I feel heaven coming down like buckets of honey, or whether things are great at church or great at work, no matter what, God needs me to be a fighter. I've got to understand it ain't going to be easy. I've got to understand there are going to be tough days where the enemy comes against my mind and says things to me that nobody else could hear. Has the devil ever tried to talk you out of serving God? Come on, somebody, and say amen. But I'm telling you, you cannot join a heavenly militia thinking that you're going to go into protective custody. Anybody know that if you are involved in a criminal investigation, there's something they call protective custody. They do that for the person who may forfeit information. And they say, well, we're going to put you in protective custody so the enemy cannot get to you. Well, I want you to understand I'm thankful for the blood. We sang about the blood this morning. I'm thankful that the enemy cannot cross the bloodline. But never take for granted and think uh, that because the enemy cannot cross the bloodline uh, that God's got you in protective custody and you'll never go through a trial. You'll never be faced with any kind of adversity because the truth is uh, that much of the adversity that we face makes us stronger. It makes us more resilient. Uh, It gives us a testimony. Uh, The reason that I can get up and tell you that you can make it through depression is I've been there. The reason that I can tell you that you can make it through almost seeing your spouse die and that you can make it when you have seen others die. I can tell you you can make it when you think your ministry is about to fall apart. It's because I've been there and I chose to keep fighting rather than quit and lay down on the battlefield. Somebody say, God, help us be a fighter. Amen. We've seen way too many that have already fell by the wayside. Say amen, church. But there are two different places that I see much of the church world today. They're in one of these two places. First of all, they would rather go back to Egypt than to fight for Canaan. Oh, well, that's just too much trouble. Let's go back to the leeks and the garlic and the onions uh, of slavery. At least we got to eat, you know, three square meals a day. Uh, We knew what to expect. We knew when to get up and go to work. We knew how things were going to jook and jive. Uh, We knew what life was like back in Egypt. Some folks would rather have the slavery of the bondage of the world uh, than to be able to serve 
God and have some trials that we get. lean on the grace of God to get us through. Uh, listen, no matter whether or not you're serving the Lord uh, or you're not serving the Lord, honey, you are going to fight. Uh, you're going to fight if you're a Christian and you're going to fight if you're not a Christian. I would to say, would to God to tell you this morning, uh, why don't we just bristle on up uh, like a little old hound dog uh, and say, not in my court today, uh, not in my patch of woods today. Uh, I'm going to fight for what belongs to me. It's a shame when people are more bristled up over things that are just carnal or common everyday stuff than they are their relationship with God. What do you mean? Can you make it real? Well, I do my best to try. We got any ladies in the house that's married? Raise your hand. Hmm? Sister Victoria, let me ask you a question. I'm going to pick on you this morning. All right. If you're out in a restaurant somewhere, and you and your man sitting there, y'all enjoying a meal, and Miss Thang come walking by, looking over at the husband, smiling real big, you know, walking and jiggling while she's walking, you know, where there you're sitting, and, you, and she's smiling, and she won't quit looking at him. What you going to be thinking? Girl, Honey, please, this is my man. Turn around. Hmm? Some of you ladies, you'd be pretty bristled up. I know how you are. I don't know what. She, I've even heard some of them speak up out loud. I don't know what she's looking at, but she needs to look somewhere else. I don't know what she's looking at. You don't know what I put up with out of this old rascal right here to have all these years of marriage. Go on somewhere. And I'm being funny, but I'm going to tell you something. Some folk out there, they would put up a fight, boy, they'd gouge your eyeballs out with a set of car keys. Huh? If you come up trying to talk about taking their man from them. But there are some people, you just hand your salvation right on over to the devil to take it. Just take everything. I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, raised around church. I know a lot about the Spirit. I know some about the Word of God. But here you go. Take it all. I don't know about you, but I got something worth fighting for. Everything God's ever done for me is worth fighting for. And if you don't realize what you got worth fighting for, you ain't going to fight for it. But I know what I got, and it's greater than all the money in all the bank of the world. That's why the Bible said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world? and lose his own soul. You need to bristle up, sister and brother, and say, no, you can't have my marriage. No, you can't have my salvation. No, you cannot have my victory. No, you cannot have my talent. No, in Jesus' name, no. You can't have my ministry. I know you're fighting, but there's a lot of people who'd rather go back to Egypt than fight for Canaan. And then there's other people who are weary and tired of fighting. Listen, when you get out there in the water, if you've ever read stories of people that drowned, do you know what happens with a lot of folks? They get tired of fighting, and they finally just give in to the water. I remember some years ago I was reading a story about a a group of men that had got uh, stranded out in the ocean. Their boat was wrecked, took on water, There they were on the outside of that ship, barely clinging to life. And one of the men said that for hours on end, he floated out there, no sign of rescue for miles, black as it could be. And I've heard people say, I've never been out there in the ocean like that in the middle of the night. But they say it's some of the darkest dark you've ever seen. The only light you get is a reflection of the moon off the water, so you hope that that's shining bright. Uh, But this man, he told the story of how that he had been out there treading water for hours at a time. His body began to set in some hypothermia from the cold water. And after a while, he said, I began to think to myself, you're going to die out here. You're so weak, you can't even hardly move your arms anymore. You're going to die anyway. What you ought to do is just go underwater and take one big gulp and just get it over with. It's going to happen anyway. Well, the story went on to say that about the time that that went through his mind, all of a sudden, way off in the distance, uh, he saw a little bitty light uh, come to find out it was somebody coming to rescue them. 
But the reason that I told you that is that there are times of your life that you've been treading water for an awful long time. That I've been dealing with a marriage that's on the rocks a long time. I've been dealing with mental illness for a long time. I've been dealing with feeling like I'm a nobody for a long time. Do you understand what I've been through? I've been treading water and I feel like I'm at a point in my life. What is the use? Why do I go to church? Why do I stay in this marriage? Why do I keep this job? Why do I keep this church? Let me tell you, keep on fighting. You might start seeing a little tiny light way off in the distance. Somebody say, help me tonight or this morning, Jesus. I want to tell you something, folks. There's something for you to think about. Now, I know that this might be a lot of meat for us to swallow. Huh? I realize that. I understand that this ain't no pat you on the diaper and give you some desident and send you on your way kind of sermon. But I just want to tell you something, folks. If you can't fight in the battles we face every day of our life, how do you expect to ride in the battle of Armageddon when the blood is up to the horse's bridle? That army of the Lord, come on, somebody. You say, but Pastor Myers, it gets hard at times. Do you realize the reason it's so hard on some of us is because of our choices, because of the choices you decide. Come on, the people you choose to run with, the things you allow in your life, and then you complain about how hard it is. I want to tell you, like one preacher said many years ago, if you live easy for Jesus, it's going to be If you live hard for Jesus, it'll be a whole lot easier. There are some folks, they got to think backwards because somebody told them, come on over. We'll turn on some lights. We'll make you feel real good. And when you leave the church, you'll feel like you're walking on cloud nine. That's all right for the time being. But when you walk out the doors of the church, get in the car, put the key in the ignition and drive down the road, and you get a text from your husband and says, I'm filing divorce papers. I don't, I'm not in love with you anymore. Then what do you do? Because let me tell you, it's great to feel good. But you got to be a fighter. And if you ain't a fighter, you're not going to make it very far. you got to have a tenacity and a resilience about you that you say, no, I know what I got and you can't have it. I know what I have. I know what the Lord's done in me and you cannot have it. Can I show you something valuable here from the Word of God? The Apostle Paul called this the good fight. The good. Is there anything good about fighting? I mean, fighting is can be violent. It can be hand to hand. It can get physical. Fighting. Paul called it the good fight. Two different times in Scripture when he encouraged preacher Timothy, he said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. In other words, man, get a grip on it and don't let it slip through your hands. Lay hold on it. Hold on to it for dear life. Sister or brother, the devil's come to try to steal away everything you've ever experienced. Your mama raised you right. Your daddy tried to tell you right. The preacher tried to tell you right. Are you going to let it all go down the drain? Are you going to hold on and say, no, ma'am, no, sir. I'm going to be a fighter. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. He said, be, he said, the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Then he said, at the end of life's race, again, we hear the same sentiment in verse number 7 of chapter 4. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. One of the greatest testimonies a dying man or woman can have is I fought. I was church hurt, but I fought. I had problems at home nobody knew about, but I fought. I had insecurities about how smart or dumb I was and how I wasn't as good as they were. I was overweight. I wasn't smart like they were. I didn't go to college like they did. I had insecurities about everything I was not, but I fought. Huh? I 
got up and sang when others could out sing me, but I fought. I got up and preached when everybody around me could out preach me, but I fought. I said I fought. And I wonder how many people this morning say, I'm fighting. I'm not going to lay down. Oh, no. It ain't going to be easy. And it may take a while for you to come out of that place you're in. But brother, sister, don't stop fighting. Put up some resistance. When the enemy comes to your doorstep and you're all by yourself, it's you. No preachers around. No preacher's wife. Nobody to give you a word of encouragement. And he gets in your ear and he starts telling you how sorry you are. How you're wasting your time. Why do you even try? You're such a failure. Look how many times you fell on your face. You're pathetic. Just quit. If the enemy didn't know you could make it, he would not tell you to quit. (laughs) But he knows that by the grace of God, if you keep your face set like a flint, you can make it. So if he can talk you out before you make it, you won't make it. Can I share with you a few things that you're going to have to learn to fight in if you're going to make it? Somebody say, God, speak to us this morning. One of the number one things that you're going to have to contend with, in case no other preachers ever come by to tell you this, I got news for you. They may not tell you, but I'm about to. If you're going to be a fighter, you're going to have to contend with temptation. You can be the most sanctified saint in the whole room. You could be equivalent to the Virgin Mary, but you're going to face temptation. Huh? But you've got to fight temptation. You can choose to be David on the rooftop looking at Bathsheba or Joseph leaving your coat in the hands of Potiphar's wife. you got to fight. you got to fight. You can't just lay down. You can't give the enemy everything God's blessed you with. Say amen. You're going to have to fight sickness. I'm not just talking about old typical got a runny nose kind of sickness. I'm talking about sickness that comes from hell that tries to bring you to your knees. I know what sickness feels like. I've done been there, but you got to fight through it when you're laying on your back in the hospital and the devil says, you ain't going to make it out of this. You got to fight. I know what it feels like to be in a place. The doctor said, this is wrong with you, and this is what could happen. And, and here you are, you're like, I'm, I preach the gospel. I'm a preacher. I don't understand this. I've got so much more in me to give. And why? What, what, this would make no sense, and I don't understand. But you, you can't quit fighting. Say amen, somebody. If you're going to fight and you're going to make it, you're going to fight jealous people. No way. Everybody in the church is so good. Everybody in the church is like your grandma to make you pan of biscuits with a side of gravy on a cold winter morning. Everybody's like that. No, they ain't. I said, no, they ain't. Some people can't stand the fact that you're doing better than they are. Some people can't stand the fact that your husband treats you as good as he does and theirs don't. Come on now and say, man, jealous people. If you thought you were going to join a sheepfold with no wolves in it, you're mistaken. I've got something I've been saying for a few years. You can coin it for your own if you'd like. But even Jesus had a Judas. And if you think you're going to go through the wheat field without any wolves in there, if you think you're not going to have no tares, you are sadly mistaken. I'm not the kind of preacher to make it sound like you're going to sign up in this army and never be called to active duty. You're just going to sit on the sideline. No! If you join up in this army, there are going to be some battles. But if you're a fighter, 
you'll have a testimony. You'll be able to encourage your children. Honey, yeah, mama faced that. They told me I had breast cancer too, but I made it through it. Yeah, baby, me and your daddy went through the same thing when I found out he had prostate cancer and we thought the end was near, but we made it through. Yeah, babe, I know what it feels like to be paying your tithes when you find out your husband's only source of work is taken right out from underneath you like a carpet snatched out from underneath you, but we made it because we fought through it and God kept us. Come on, somebody. You're going to have to face jealous people. You're going to have to fight discouragement. Do you know that probably one of the biggest things you will fight as a Christian is discouragement. Discouragement, yeah. One of the biggest battles people in ministry fight is discouragement. When we went to Mayaka to pastor there, one of the, one of the uh, brothers that visited one day, I got to talking to him about ministry. And he told me about a seasoned pastor's wife who that everybody had a tremendous amount of confidence in. Her husband, which was a pastor for many years, passed away and now she's a widow woman. And this preacher got a chance to sit down and talk with her one day. He says, Sister so-and-so, I've been called into pastoring. And I wanted to talk with you because you and your husband pastored for so many years. What do you think if there was one thing you could tell me to make it in ministry, what would it be? He said that, that old seasoned saint looked at him, Sister Rachel, and said, Learn how to overcome discouragement you know why because she knew what it felt like to give everything you've got when everybody else don't she knew what it felt like to plan when nobody showed up she knew what it felt like to sacrifice when nobody else would she knew what it felt like to be let down when you had your hopes so high discouragement if you're a fighter you will make it through discouragement You might have some low ebbs where you go down, but you're coming back up. Do you remember what the man of God said? Rejoice not against me, mine enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise. Woo! In other words, I might go down a little bit. My flame may flicker a little bit, looking like my fire's going out, but I'm a fighter. Don't count a fighter out. Come on, when you lose that fight, you're in bad shape. I might be beat up. I got a big old black eye. My lips stuck out. I haven't been in church like I should in a while. I'm looking pretty pathetic in the spirit right now. But don't count me out. Because if my mom and daddy raised anything, they raised a fighter. I've made some bad decisions and so have you. But I've got to fight. And as long as i got to fight, God's going to add the grace of God. We're going to make it. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Not only that, but you're going to have to fight through seasons of monotony. Stuff that seems like the same old, same old, same old. Do you know people that jump from church to church to church and sometimes they don't make it long? It's because the people who have not embraced the fact that just like everyday life, sometimes things seem like you're compassing the same old mountain. It's Sunday. They probably gonna sing one of the same old five hymnals they sang last week and the week before. And Pastor Myers gonna get up with his big mouth and he's gonna preach a while. We're gonna pray three seconds and go to the house. The monotony of the experience, if you're not a fighter during the cold seasons, during the dry seasons, you won't make it. There ain't a saint that's still serving God that has never gone through a dry season or a low season or a difficult season. If you're a seasoned saint, you've been through them all. And you know why you're still here? You kept punching when you couldn't feel what you was punching. You kept running when you didn't know which direction sometimes to run. But you kept on. You had a resilience about you. And while many, let me ask you a question. Some of you have been serving the Lord for a while. Raise your hand if you've seen some fall by the wayside since you've been saved. Is that not a heartbreaking thing? Some that have just fell by the wayside. You wonder why would you do that? Because the fight has come to them. 
And instead of continuing to fight, they let go. They let go. I told you last week, and I, I interjected this little nugget from this message, and I just want to remind you, you're going to have to fight distractions. But on the way to church this morning, the Lord began to deal with me about something else that I didn't think about all the other times. And if God held me up to preach this message to today because of this one thing, I'm all right with it. But you're going to have to fight the urge to quit. I just want to tell you this morning, if anybody tries to make it out like you're going to serve the Lord and you will never think about, I hope you don't. Maybe there might be a handful in the, in the big haystack of life. I don't know. But most every Christian I have ever talked to that has ever been honest has had to fight the urge to quit. They got hurt by somebody in church so badly they had to fight the urge to quit. They sat up under a ministry that went sour and the preacher became, they found out he was a hypocrite and they fought the urge to just quit. They lost a spouse and it nearly train wrecked their entire life. And, and the questions of why caused them to have an urge to quit. They looked around about them, Sister Patricia, and they saw their next door neighbor who just bought the $400,000 house and big family and all the time partying and having a good time, you know. And they just bought a couple four-wheelers and ATVs and side-by-sides and bass boats. And they seemed to be doing so good. And they got their eyes off the prize and they started having to fight the urge to quit. If you're going to make it, you have to be able to know first there are going to be times the enemy says, why are you trying? Why are you still going? Why does it even make a difference? Why don't you just, why don't you just quit? You know you just play in church. You're just going to church with your wife just because she goes. That's the only reason why you're going. That's the only reason. You might as well quit. You already lost anyway. You might as well admit it. That's the way the devil works. You have to be a fighter. Some of you men, if somebody come along and grabbed the hand of your wife and started walking off with her and said, well, we're going on about our way. This is my wife now. You wouldn't, you wouldn't stand for that. But don't you realize the enemy's doing, trying to do the same thing with what God's done in you? You will say, well, I ain't where I need to be. Are you where you were when you first gave your life to God? Well, no. Well, then keep on about it because I'm going to tell you something. Every one of us had to grow in grace. Are you a fighter or are you a quitter? Because in 2023, it still takes a fighter. Stand across the church house this morning. Sister Miranda's coming to the piano. I started looking through the Word of God. And the more that I read through God's Word, I began to realize that the people who are celebrated for great victories, they're not the people who quit. They're the people who fought. Those are the names. The Apostle Paul understood that when he said, I have fought a good fight. Of all the fights that I could, I could fight about when my parents died and I could fight over who got the house and who got the car and I could fight over who got mama's pajamas, you know, I could fight over, I could fight over lots of stuff. I could fight over who makes more money at work. But he said, I fought a good fight. Of all the fights in life, this is the best fight of all. He said, I fought a good fight. I fought for something worth fighting for. And I kept the faith. You see, this is what we have to realize. First of all, that it is a fight. To just vaguely tell somebody, you want to get saved, come to the altar, great. Sign your name on a church roll, you're saved. 
Now, if we never see you again, that's fine. You're doing somebody a disservice to do that because if you don't let them people understand, honey, you're going to fight. You give your life to the Lord, there are going to be times you're laying in the bed and your mind will be tormented about stuff and you can't go to sleep. Demonic powers and spirits will come against your home, you, because he don't like the idea that you gave your life to God. But you tell him, you're going to have to fight. Every time you go down, you get a treatment or you go to the hospital, have a procedure, and they look at you and say, hey, tell your grandkids, your kids, say, you see what we're doing? We're having a fight. This is what life's like. This reality. And if you're going to make it, you got to be a fighter. you got to realize that it is a fight. Not only that, but you got to realize that it's worth the fight. It's worth it. All this world has to offer you will never compare to that eternal life on the other side of this life with Christ. There's nothing you're going through right now, no, no sadness, no sorrow, worth you throwing in a towel for what, li- what lies ahead and awaits you in the eternal after. And lastly, you're going to have to stay in this fight. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed across the church, I want to ask you this morning, are you willing right this very minute to say, God, I'm going to stay in this fight. You haven't told anybody that you've been thinking about quitting. You haven't told anybody about the pressure. And if you did, it, wasn't, it was vague. You didn't really go into detail, but you've been fighting some things and against some things. But if you're that person this morning or one of those that say, I'm going to stay in this fight by the grace of God, I want you right now, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want you to come onto this altar right now. And you say, Pastor Myers, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want you to do that either. But how serious are you about making a proclamation with God that says I'm going to stay in this fight if it's the last thing I do come on is that you devil you ain't taking me out of this you're not going to steal my testimony away in the name of Jesus you are not going to take the victory that I have in my life. Have you felt pressure in your home, in your family, and the devil's trying to divide everybody against each other? Are you a fighter? Are you willing to get in a prayer place and fight for your family? Why would you give up that easy? Is it not worth it? Does it not mean anything to you? If you're not praying this morning, I want you to come and help me find somebody and pray with them this morning, please. I'd like to see some prayer warriors. There are people that came to this altar because they seriously wanted to talk to the Lord. Let's help them pray this morning. Come on. Ladies, find another lady and help them pray. Brethren, come on, let's pray for our brothers. Father, through the precious name of Jesus this morning. Oh, I'm asking you by your grace right now, God, that you apply that healing help. God, that only you can bring to us in the time and season of our life. We need it so badly. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to be a fighter. I'm going to be tough as nails. Hebrews in the fire. Oh, when I was in the world, when I was out there in the world, nobody would want to cross me. Nobody would want to try to whoop me. What about in the spiritual? You're pretty bad. You're pretty tough. Pretty strong. If you ain't, you need to bristle up and be. No, you can't have my marriage. You can't have my family. You can't have my children. You can't have my sanity, my clarity of mind. You can't have my peace. He can't have my peace. Hand, I'm fighting. Just hold on. In the name of you Jesus, I'm fighting. Every doctor's visit, I'm fighting. Every treatment, I'm fighting. Morning oh, yeah. Coming. Let them grandbabies and granddaughters Press see a fighter in Grandma. On. Let them see a fighter in the name of Jesus. One who says, I refuse to lose. I refuse to now give up. Your I refuse to quit. 
I refuse like to turn around. I've done come too far. Can you I'm not quitting. The pain you feel oh, I've got a resilience in me. Gone it might not be the easiest season I've ever been in, but don't count when me out. I'm not a quitter. You, come on, my mama didn't raise no quitter. No my daddy didn't raise no quitter. He said, get back up and fight. Long. You'll see the Come on, pick up a two by four and jump back in the ring if you have to. Oh, Hallelujah. Oh, God. When you're hanging by your This ain't been no easy thing. And you've cried all but Help your us to tears. please not give up on one another. And most of all, help us never said. give up on Christ. Come That's on, mamas. Jesus comes running. Your babies are watching everything you, you do. Oh, is mama a fighter? On, you can is granny a fighter? Is she willing to carry on? Press Hold on. that torch. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a fighter in the name of Jesus. I'm a fighter. Oh, yeah.